But I run a research lab in, uh, in Cambridge, and what we do is we play all day long with future technologies and uh, look to see if we can, can see what the future of um, uh, computing is going to be. So I want to talk to you today a little bit about some future technology that we're seeing. And the future te technology I want to, to talk about, how's the microphone doing? It's making funny noises, is it okay? Um, is natural user interface, what people have started to call natural user interface. So we had, in the history of computing, played before you at lightning speed, we had a uh, green screen and the cursor, and then we had the, uh, the mouse and windows, and in the last few years we've had touch and multi-touch, and now something new is coming, which is no touch. So this is interacting with computers without um, being in contact with them at all. For example, you know, one thing that we've experimented with a lot, which I, I, I fervently believe will happen eventually, is that I could give this presentation um, quite a long way away from my laptop, just by kind of uh, gesturing to the laptop, maybe uh, speaking to it occasionally. You might find that a little weird. Okay, well, I'll do it with gestures then. Forwards, backwards, fast forwards, and so on. Now, this technology is really here. So far, it's been, exper it's been uh, explored in the context of gaming, and um, you guys are totally sold on the idea of gaming. I'm very impressed what I've heard today, how, how much you see um, gaming as a, as a gold mine for education. I, mean, I think that's very exciting. And gaming has also been a great platform for us to explore this new no-touch interaction technology. So um, Xbox have just brought out the Kinect, and uh, you may have been playing with it this this Christmas, I certainly was, and um, uh, a lot of the technology for it was done in my lab. Here are some of the people that I, I want to call out. My young colleague, Jamie Schossen, he's a kind of gaming age kind of a guy, and he's also a bit of a genius, and uh, uh, he's built some amazing technology into this. And then, of course, there's a huge team in uh, Seattle, which is head office of Microsoft, that have done some amazing engineering on this. Um, so what is it? Did you get one? You get to play games with this? It's, it's like, you know, in, in many ways, it's like taking the revolution that was the Wii and taking it one stage further on. Now all your limbs are active without you held, holding any kind of device. Um, and all of the, the things that you do with your body can be recognized. This opens up um, many, many more games. Are you going to do something? Here we are. Uh, here, if you didn't get one at Christmas, I had one in, in my house and uh, we had a party and the, the, uh, the, the kids came and the adults came and the gaming room was set aside for the kids, except, oh dear, the kids didn't get, even get to get into the room because the adults were so busy playing the games. It really is, I'm actually not a gamer, you know, the, the, um, uh, the lady who spoke second today, you know, was asking the, the class and so on, you know, who's a gamer, who put up your hand? I actually wouldn't put, put up my hand as a gamer, but this is different. Somehow this um, draws you in even if you don't particularly think of yourself as being a gamer. So gaming, as I say, is, is the uh, playground for exploring this technology and it's become a very um, serious playground, but I see many other possibilities. For example, here is a rather interesting uh, device called an AnyBot, which is actually designed to take your place at a meeting if you can't be there, designed by a company in California. And um, so you can imagine driving the AnyBot from the movements of your own body, you know, sitting in your own uh, uh, workspace, while the kind of slave, you, um, acts out your, mo your movements in, um, uh, in the, the uh, conference room or whatever it is the space where you're supposed to be interacting. And... Um, Here's another possibility down at the bottom left there, uh, physiotherapy, that we could be uh, um, measuring automatically the movements of, uh, of people's bodies. Actually, this is one of the kind of oldest uses of, um, of motion capture. Um, what else? At the bottom, of course, is the, you know, the, the uh, science fiction view of um, interacting with technology by um, uh, moving your, your hands around. And uh, on the right, various uh, user interfaces at the, um, at the top right, 
there's actually a, a kind of mock-up of a system that you might have in the operating theatre where um, you can imagine the surgeon wanting to have better access to three-dimensional information about your body. If you're being operated on, you particularly like this if the surgeon has the best possible quality of information about you. And, um, of course, the surgeon is, has got instruments and is all gloved up and uh, would like, perhaps, to be able to move over to the computer and do something with a keyboard and mouse to get the, the view of the three-dimensional uh, um, MRI or X-ray data that corresponds to what he's seeing uh, in the real you, but if he did that, he'd have to go and scrub up again afterwards. So wouldn't it be fantastic to be able to just um, make gestures, move the hands, and um, get, the right, uh, get the right effect? Next is a system that actually Toshiba built um, with a previous generation of technology controlling a DVD player, rather like what I was um, envisioning with the, um, the lecture scenario. And at the bottom right, a rather scary scenario. Many cars are coming out now with um, head-up displays on, the, uh, on the, their windscreens. And, um, you know, it would be either wonderful or horrible, I'm not quite sure which, to be able to point at stuff on the screen as you drive along, and uh, who knows what people will do with that. I just wanted to spend a minute or two telling you how this works because, you know, I'm a technologist. I can't help it. I just, I just want to tell you what's, uh, what's inside the box, but I, uh, I won't overdo it, I promise. I've, I've scrubbed out all the formulae that I had for another talk. No, maybe some of you love formulae. So the, the, the basic problem is to capture the pose of the human body. How do you do this? Well, what do we mean by the problem anyway? Actually, what we have to do is take the human body as uh, depicted in cartoon on the left and reduce it to a set of angles and positions. So if I can tell you the angles between all, uh, all your connected limbs and the positions of, your, of the parts of your body, we'd be done. That's the problem. So, um, you know, what's the fuss? Why is it hard? Well, you know, human bodies come in many different configurations. Uh, you, the, the, maybe you can't do that, but there are people who can. And... Uh, they come in many different shapes, and they come in many different sizes, and the appearances can be quite deceptive, and also they can come in complex contexts where they take some unpicking, if you like, from their surroundings. Actually, there are systems you can buy out there. They use them in the movies. So, for example, in Titanic, when uh, all those guys um, slid down the ship and into the water, they didn't do that with a real ship. No, they had a slide, and the stuntmen were put on the slide, and they uh, slid down the slide, and they were all instrumented, actually, with this system on the left, the Vicon system, where uh, little markers are attached to the body. And that works incredibly well. It's very precise, used in medicine for measuring um, uh, walking pr uh, problems that need great surgery, all kinds of things. But, of course, it's not practical for our kind of interaction. It might, uh, as, as, a, as, a cas as casual computer users, as casual appliance users, it would require you to spend an hour being instrumented up before you use the machine. Clearly not practical. Now, the, the thing, the revolution that's really um, brought this, uh, this kind of um, technology into the mainstream, I've been working on these kinds of problems for at least 15 years, but the, uh, the brilliant insight from my colleague in Seattle, Alex Sit uh, Kipman, was that if we use three-dimensional cameras... And if the three-dimensional cameras could be engineered down to commodity prices, which they now have with Kinect, this would completely change the game. And why is that? Because now, when the three-dimensional camera sees the human body, it is automatically peeled away from its environment. So as I said, one of the big problems is that you are kind of glued to your environment. As far as a dumb TV camera is concerned, a commodity, a web camera or a, um, a, a photography camera, it sees you kind of pressed against your environment because the camera doesn't have 3D understanding as far as you're, it's concerned. You're a kind of poster with, uh, with a lot of, um, you know, this would be a nightmare for this kind of technology because of all the people behind me. So a system, uh, um, an intelligent computer system that wants to, to get me has got to peel me from all of the other um, people in the backdrop who look very like me in, uh, in some sense. So here we are. The depth camera does that for you. That's, that really is a breakthrough. Now, the next step is to take that depth image uh, shown on the left here and infer the different parts of the body. So this inference, this is using machine intelligence technology, is happening in um, a fraction of a second. I mean, it gets renewed uh, uh, 60 times a second, and that 60th of a second, only a fraction of that is required to label up all of those colors, the kind of um, uh, clown suit you see there. Oh my goodness, I didn't know this one moved. And this, what I wanted to say is that this technology builds on 
um, explorations that people had already done in object recognition. So you know that sometimes your camera will be quite intelligent about grouping people together, and that's because it can do face detection. And that kind of technology, shown here, used to, to uh, detect um, uh, cows and cars and roads and so on, is... Um, is something that scientists have explored a lot, and it's the kind of um, knock-on effect from that scientific exploration. And just the one last thing I want to say about the how it works. How am I doing? Five minutes, good. Um, one last thing I want to say about the how it works is that uh, you remember there was this, the slide that showed all the variations of human, how they can be fat or thin, and how they can be tall or short, and how they can be in different contexts. And um, the way the um, intelligent software works is by learning. So just as, I mean, you guys are in the teaching business, and we are also in the teaching business. So what we do is we actually teach the computer to recognize. That's because actually telling a computer to recognize in terms of a series of rules is impossible. People have tried it, and it just can't be done. Just as, you know, if you imagine trying to tell a child how to read by telling it about, you know, some of the details of letter shapes, you, you could never do it. You just have to show the child um, lots and lots of letters. And we do rather the same thing with the computer. We show the computer many, many different human bodies in different configurations, different sizes and shapes of bodies in different contexts. And um, to cut a long story short, the learning software, it takes, by the way, about a week to learn a new recognizer when you uh, supply a new set of, uh, of examples because uh, computers learn uh, quite slowly. But that's what, what, that's what it does. This is all learnt just in the way that children learn. And uh, so finally, um, when, when you've done that, you can show new bodies to the com computer system and it comes up with this consistent labeling. The head is always coming out in red and so on and the, the foot in green and so on. And that's, that is the fruit, if you like, of this object recognition. So that's how it all works. It's amazing technology. Oh, one, one last step is that once you've done that, you can um, identify each individual joint in the, in the body and, uh, and um, track the joints as they move. And that's what's happening here. These are, I don't know if any of you are into psychology, but if you do psychology at university, you probably learn about Johansson figures, uh, which are these figures where you um, label every joint of the body with its motion. And it's amazing how you can recognize, isn't it, what the body is doing just from those joints. And so in the same way, the computer has really all the salient information about what that human body is doing. And this is going to be combined with many other technologies, speech, other sensors, I uh, just uh, want to mention very briefly some amazing work that was done at Cambridge University and now being carried on at MIT where computers can actually now recognize emotions. So the computer can look at the human, a human face and recognize very subtly um, uh, what emotions are being represented. And this actually is a, is a very unexpected spin-off from autism research. So they actually used video databases that are used for testing autism. And they used those databases to train the computer in expression recognition. It's just amazing work. Um, so there we are, the future of NUI. Um, many different applications. It begins with gaming that you all know and love. I think it's going to go a long way beyond gaming into appliances that we have uh, in our, our environments that we're familiar with. I don't really know what form these things are going to take. Uh, I'm not a designer myself. I'm a technology, so you know, we delight in providing a kind of middle layer which um, uh, designers can use, and uh, I'm just very excited, as I already have been with, uh, in the gaming um, scenario, to see what design-oriented people come up with when they're confronted with this new technology. Now, I just want to finish with a little bit of a right turn um, uh, onto a different topic, which is just to take up, actually, the, the topic that David Braben was mentioning, that, you know, computer science really is shaping the world. Uh, here's an area where computer science um, is, is, going to re is really going to change things. Of course, uh, you know, the World Wide Web is the, the, probably the greatest British com uh, invention in computer science. It's an amazing invention. Tim Berners-Lee um, did that. Computer science really is changing the way we do things. But what is happening about computer science in school? Thank you, David, for saying computer science and ICT are not the same subject. I, I don't want to do down ICT at all. I think, you know, yes, of course we need to learn ICT, but ICT is about consuming computing, whereas computer science is about providing 
computing, about innovating in computing. And I, I agree with all the things that, that David said. Computer science is an exciting intellectual challenge. The number of computer scientists that we need in, this, in the country, we're very good at computer science industries, is going up. And yet, the number taking A-levels, the number doing degrees in computer science is going down. It's tragic. We have the capacity as a country to be so good at this. Intellectually, it's something very exciting that you can offer your pupils. And so, call to arms. Let's restore computer science to its rightful um, place in schools and see it flourish. Thank you very much. Professor Andrew, Professor Andrew Blake, thank you so much. And um, I think we are going to wrap things up now because back in here from 2 p.m. looking at and beyond the digital horizon, but I just want to particularly thank for ending with uh, this games-based learning session with the idea of computers that learn from us as well as us learning from computers. Thank you to all our speakers. Thank you for attending the session. I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you.